So what we're exploring in this film is what are the different ways of knowing that we've lost access to, why are they important, and how do we bring them back into the conversation. So this will include clips from Ian McGilchrist, who's the author of the bestseller The Master and His Emissary, and John Verveke, who we've had on the channel a few times as well, and who created the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis series. We have a brilliant systems theorist called Nora Bateson, and she's actually new to the channel. And then also Greg Thomas, who's also new to the channel, who runs the Jazz Leadership Project. And Benita Roy as well, who, who's been on the channel a couple of times, who's also a, a brilliant systems theorist and facilitator. So we're also launching this as a series that I'm writing on Medium, and it's going to be a little bit of a different format than we've done before in that it's a three article series. And the first article is launching at the same time as this film. So in addition to this, we've also recorded a conversation between John Bavaki and Ian McGilchrist, so them speaking for the very first time, uh, which I actually recorded yesterday, I'll probably put it out in a week or two, and it was really interesting hearing them, they really got into a nice flow with each other and felt that their, Ian's perspective of the left brain, right brain way of knowing and how our perception itself is kind of split, really mapped onto John Vivekis really kind of pioneering work with wisdom and in the uh, fourth generation cognitive science space. There's a lot of really interesting parallels between them that are coming out even in the dialogues. Yeah, and the first article in this series actually includes both John Verbeke and Ian McGilchrist's works and compares and contrasts them to see how do their different models of how we perceive and, and really the machinery of our perception, so our, our brains and our entire bodies and what uh, is now called embodied cognition, how does that influence how we perceive and what does it matter? So McGilchrist has his model of the, um, the bicameral mind, so the way in which the difference between our left and right hemisphere has huge influence on how we see the world and even in our culture. And then I had a conversation with John Verveke because I was curious about this and knew that as a cognitive scientist, he would have a very interesting take on it. And uh, unsurprisingly, he had a very interesting take on it. And he's actually been working on uh, what he calls the four different ways of knowing. So that became a really, really useful frame. And I wanted to just play a clip around that so we can um, hear it from John himself. And so as I've been researching it, one of the, um, one of the core concepts that came up was um, embodied cognition. And I yes. thought... That definitely sounds like something to talk to John Verveke about. <laughs> so, uh, so here we are. When we were setting this up, you mentioned that you're working on something right now um, around the four different ways of knowing, and I thought that could yeah. be a cool place to start. Sure. I've, you know, I, I, it, it's in parts of the series because one of the thesis of the th uh, series is we've sort of lost touch, and this is picked up by the embodied cognition approach. We've lost touch with sort of, I don't mean uh, in, our, in our sort of, implicit lives, but we've lost theoretical touch and existential touch with uh, procedural knowing and perspectival and propositional. So let me go through the four, if you'll allow me. I'm going to try, I mean, you, you know, taxonomies aren't true or false. It's how consistent they are, how, how good they do at explication and explanation, um, and, so, and so forth. Um, so the one that we're, of course, most familiar with when we talk about no, knowledge is uh, knowing is propositional knowing. So this is the kind of knowledge that you capture in your uh, beliefs about propositions. Like, I know that, I know that the cat is a mammal. And so, and we've done a lot of work on that. And we have this excellent procedure for trying to improve um, our propositional knowing. It's called science, and, or if you want to make it more broadly, science and history. Um, and so, I don't have too much to say about that, uh, except that, for various historical reasons, which I won't review right now because I go over them in detail in this series, that model of knowing has come to predominate. Uh, and we've lost the other kinds of knowing that had a larger place, for example, in the ancient and medieval worlds and in other cultures too. So procedural knowledge, procedural knowing, I'll stick with knowing because I want to emphasize how much we're talking about the process here and not the product, okay? So procedural knowing is knowing how to do something, knowing how to catch a ball, knowing how to ride a bike, um, things like that. And it's captured not in beliefs, it's captured in skills. That's procedural uh, knowing. Uh, perspectival knowing uh, comes from the fact that you're not just an intelligent agent, you're a conscious agent, you have consciousness. And so uh, this is the kind of knowing you know by basically being able to inhabit uh, a perspective. Um, uh, and, and what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is um, 
the, this is a way of knowing that is relative to the state of mind you're in. So you know what it's like to be drunk and how you and the world seem when you're drunk. You know what it's like to be sober. Um, and then we can ask more specifically, well, what is that knowing like? And so I've tried to articulate that what it is is a phenomenon called salience landscaping, where the relevance realization machinery is coming into our online working memory. And what we're getting is a dynamic pattern of salience, what's standing out, what's foregrounded, backgrounded, gestalting and featuring how it's all. So, you know, what you're paying attention to, what you're ignoring, that's your salience landscape. And so it, it gives you your, your, your knowing of your here nowness. So it gives you your situational awareness. So the procedural skills ultimately sit in uh, and are nested by um, your perspectival salience landscaping. But then we have to ask, yeah, but what, what coordinates you as an organism and the environment such that a perspective is possible? And so that comes in, and that's where we get really deeply into the embodied cognition, although all, all three of these last three are deeply about embodiment. Um, this is this is a participatory knowing. This is this is the this is the way in which you identify with and inhabit your mind and body, such that you right make identities for the world that are right co-relevant. So you become an agent in a world uh, that is an arena to you. So, for example, your biology puts significant constraints on um, how if. Uh, you know, sort of the logistics of your cognition, and it limits how you can move around in the world. And then that means it puts constraints on the kind of agency you can exercise, and it also puts constraints on what aspects of the world can be disclosed to you. And in the dialogue between Ian and John, they really covered new ground in terms of their sort of models of the world. John Viveki talks about fourth generation cognitive science and how fourth generation cognitive science is really all about embodied cognition. That this whole sort of Descartian split of the mind and the body is gone. In the latest cognitive science, that's, that's no longer uh, a workable model, which really then brings it much more into kind of Ian's realm because he, Ian's very scathing about kind of how reductive we can be and how reductive our models of cognition can be. So it was really interesting seeing that uh, John was able to kind of explain and lay out to Ian a lot of where the science is going, which is sort of this real excitement, I think, for both of them. And that's something I think they both share. You know, uh, John Viveki talks about that first, four, first of the four ways of knowing is propositional knowing. So that's knowing that. So propositional knowing, you know, he describes it as that's really, we're quite good at that. That's the knowing of, of science and history. And we have methods for figuring out what something is and, and knowing that. But we, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but he points out that we have over-relied on it and that when we over-rely on it, we start losing access to these other ways of knowing, which are much more about being embedded and participating in the world and having sort of a deep kind of attunement with the world around us. And really similarly, Ian talks about how the, the left hemisphere, which has come to dominate much of our thinking, is really narrowly focused and it tends to break things into their constituent parts. So it's, it's, um, it doesn't really see people as people, it sees them as kind of assemblages of parts. Uh, whereas the right is much more designed for what we don't know, so approaching problems we don't know. And we've talked on the channel a lot about the importance of coming into this liminal space, something Jordan Hall has talked about um, at length as well. So how do we come into this space where we're not sure, where we don't know and we're comfortable being in there? Because that way of knowing and that way of perceiving allows us to solve problems together that we can't if we come into it thinking we know and also kind of thinking the world is like a big computer switchboard and if we just tinker this and tinker that um, we'll, we'll kind of fix it. That's a very, I think Ian would say, that's a very left brain way of approaching problems and a right brain way of approaching problems or let's say John might call it more a more participatory knowing sense where we're sort of having a back and forth with the world and we're deeply engaged in it and we can feel everything around us and we're you know, aware of what's salient in our environment, that, that is more similar to that right brain way of knowing. And that's, that is the, one of the main ways in which we perceive that's really missing from a lot of the cultural conversation. So with all the materialist, reductionist kind of ethos we live in. And it's also missing very often from the systems change conversation. So through all these conversations, I became aware of sort of my own cognitive bias, which is that 
I'm, I don't necessarily see things as systems. I'm very focused in on the individual level and kind of what does individual transformation look like or what does it look like when, when we're in groups. And I realized there was kind of a piece missing of, of my own thinking, which was um, while I'm interested in systems theory, how does this apply to systems theory? You know, how, how do these different ways of knowing influence how we look at very, very complex systems? And the person I found to talk to around that was Nora Bateson. And Nora Bateson is well known in this whole systems change area. And she runs the Bateson Institute, which is um, an institute based in Sweden, which looks to expand the work of her father, Gregory Bateson. Uh, Gregory Bateson is a really well-known philosopher of the 20th century and particularly well-known for really growing that whole field of complexity and systems theory and also cybernetics. You know, he coined a bunch of phrases like double bind, for example. So Nora has been kind of carrying on that work and doing a lot of research. And one of the things I find really interesting about her perspective is that it's much more of a right brain and kind of participatory take on the way systems work. So very often in the system change space, people use engineering language. So they, they kind of try and map out a mental model that captures all of this complexity. And her take is that that doesn't work because the systems themselves are learning. And these systems, especially living systems, act very differently to like a dead system. So uh, uh, the ecology of a forest or the relationship you have with your family or your workplace or whatever it might be is a completely different thing than an engine or a switchboard. And yet, very often, people use the language of engineering to try and explain those deep living systems. So a whole different language is needed. And that's, I think, a really key point, which doesn't get spoken about all that much, is that our language influences our way of knowing and reinforces it. So it's very important to, to be thinking about ways of perceiving like aesthetic knowing, for example, the, the kind of feel of quality of something. You know, how, how is that quality that you can't quite put your finger on or describe? Um, so that really ties in as well to what Ian McGilchrist have talked about and John Verveke. It's this moving beyond just that reductionist frame and widening out. And once we do that, that's again why I think these different ways of knowing or even lost ways of knowing, because we have kind of lost access to a lot of them, are really, really important. So let's play a clip from Nora talking a little bit about her, her take on the, the kind of wider system space. The idea of pulling things out of context to study them, measure them, define them, was not going to be a very useful contribution to my understanding of how they are in contexts, multiple contexts across, you know, suddenly the systems model went from being an engineering map to being a 3D moving thing in time. There's plenty of great information you can get with reductionist process, but you can't understand how the vitality of a living system is actually shifting and moving. And if it's not shifting and moving, it's not alive anymore. So we have a, we have a conundrum there of how we're gonna think about what information is when so much of what has been developed in terms of what we think of as authorized information is static. And what we need to understand and respond to is complex and alive. It's amazing we've got this far. But anyway, there's been issues. <laughs> um, so warm data is that. Warm data became the way that I just started to describe how things are happening through and across and within multiple contexts simultaneously. So Ali, you've been spending like over a month researching this, interviewing people, writing really long articles on Medium. Um, why? Why is this so important? Why do you think this is so important? Why do you think it's valuable to add to the conversation? So for me, it's really important because I think it's a missing, crucial missing piece of a conversation that's potentially of existential importance. So there are a lot of tribes online right now. Uh, Peter Lindbergh's called these mimetic tribes, and he's listed about 25 of them, but there's who knows how many more. And what I became really interested in is there are a, quite a high number of these tribes, whether we're talking about QAnon, Extinction Rebellion, Deep Adaptation, Game B, 
the list goes on and on, who for probably really good reason are focused on how do we save humanity in some way or another? How do we get through the, the crises we might be facing? And they're often in a kind of narrative warfare. The reason it's frustrating is because I, f I feel they're also relying on one particular type of knowing and excluding different types of knowing. And that type of knowing is what John Vervecki calls propositional knowing. So it's knowing that. And we know that uh, gold is a mineral, for example. And knowing that is great. It's important that we know that. We have mental maps. But when we over-rely on mental maps, we create effectively ideological camps. And the more we rely on them, and the more we try and make our maps fit into the world, and almost kind of trying to make the world order our maps rather than the other way around, the more we polarize into these tribes. And it just seems to me completely counterintuitive and ineffective. So what I became really curious about uh, was what are the other ways of knowing, not what we know, not what should we do or where should we go or how do we fix this problem, but in what way should we start perceiving in order to be able to see, and as Daniel Schmachtenberger says, make sense, sense make effectively, so that we can actually move forward and so that we can come together effectively. And propositional knowing alone just definitely won't cut it. We need to have a much more liminal way of knowing. We need to be able to come at a problem with the attitude of I don't know, of this uncertainty. And from that uncertainty also comes a certain comfort with chaos. And that's something I really don't see a lot of in a lot of these, these groups is being comfortable with chaos because chaos is really difficult to describe. And you have to, I think, and this is what's really come out of talking to all these people, you have to be in some kind of space of letting go in order for that to work. You have to be willing to not know and you have to be comfortable with just, just how complex systems are, just how complex people are. You can't use game theory to solve everything. You know, for example, the prisoner's dilemma breaks down pretty rapidly if one of those prisoners is having a deep religious awakening during it. You know, there's a lot of over-rationalization, which also happens. Um, what Ian McGilchrist would refer to as kind of a left brain dominant perspective. So that became a really interesting inquiry for me. What, what are these different ways of knowing? How do we access them? Where do they add value? And crucially, how do we take them without throwing away the propositional knowing so that we are doing a yes and and we kind of bring them together in a certain way well, what's the what's the best way to bring them together so ian mcgilchrist famously wrote the book master and his emissary so ian is a psychiatrist an academic and has a very broad perspective so what master and his emissary does is looks at kind of the structure of the brain the left brain versus the right brain and those sort of different ways of perceiving the world and then maps it onto culture, maps it onto history and says that we are, we have several times in the past moved from a more holistic, balanced perspective to a more left brain, atomistic, reductive perspective. And when we do that, we get ourselves into trouble and that that's probably happening again now. Like we, we might have time to avoid it, but I know Ian's perspective, we'll play a very short clip now. What would be the elevator pitch for Master and his Emissary? It's that we're not aware that our reality is constructed by two different systems, if you like, which focus on different aspects of reality and therefore construe a world with different qualities. And the first part of the book explains that in terms of neuropsychiatry and philosophy. And the second part of the book suggests that in the history of the West, um, three times we have been in a position where, to begin with, a civilization flourished when it kept both these visions together, that of the right hemisphere and that of the left. But that in every case, and I believe we're repeating the pattern for the third time, uh, as uh, the, the, the civilization overreached itself, um, things deteriorated and the mindset became more rigid, more bureaucratic, less imaginative, less flexible, less in touch with reality and became locked into a way of thinking which is that of the left hemisphere, which is useful. Uh, it's not um, a mistake that we have it, but it cannot be our way of contacting reality. A simple way of putting it is it's like uh, mistaking the map for the territory. Yeah, and there was a concept that John Vivekian and Ian talked about in their dialogue that 
really struck home in this as well about how we perceive the world. They talked about reciprocal narrowing and could there be such a thing as reciprocal opening? And so it's kind of a complex idea. I'll play a little clip from it. Now, I have a strong belief that it's not that reality is made up by us, but no. it's not that reality just independently exists no. from us. We midwife reality into being. Yeah, our, so our, yeah. our consciousness, which is never completely separate from the consciousness of what we're looking at, brings out an aspect of something. And so we are actually not just passive observers or recipients in the cosmos, we are actors in the cosmos in bringing the cosmos into being. I want to respond to that very deeply. Uh, first of all, I agree. I think part of the straitjacket I try to get out of the series is the, uh, the, you know, the Lockean empiricism that the mind is tabula rasa and the Rousseauian uh, romanticism that the world is a blank, a blank canvas upon which we paint our subjectivity. I think those are both wrong. And so uh, I, that's why I've coined this phrase, transjectivity, about trying to break out of the subjectivity, objectivity, uh, polarization of our epistemologies. I think that's a deep mistake. And, and so I think um, that notice that that idea, um, so, uh, this will sound like a slight digression, but uh, one of my friends and colleagues, Mark Lewis, um, He's doing some of the premier work on addiction right now. And he's trying to replace the disease model of addiction, which does not, is not well supported by a lot of the data. It's well funded by governments, but it's not well supported by data with a learning model. Um, and the, he calls it reciprocal narrowing. So it goes like this. Let's say I get slightly drunk. I lose some cognitive flexibility. And so I can't notice as many options in the world. So the world starts to narrow a bit. I then internalize this, which then narrows, and you get this reciprocal narrowing until you can't notice any alternatives and you can't notice any way in which you could be other than you are. And then you're the addict, you're trapped, right? And I think that's all right. Um, I, I think that's, in fact, I think it's a brilliant account of addiction. It, it, it supports much more of the empirical data. When I had lunch with Mark, I said to him, and this is where I brought in the Neoplatonic tradition, I said, but Mark, if there's reciprocal narrowing, there must be reciprocal opening. And he went, oh, you're right. And I said that, you know, and I think this is, you know, the, the, the whole idea of the anagogue, that what we can do is we can put ourselves into that, you called it that openness in which, right? And I think this is part of what, what I see Guy Sensok was circling, how he's trying to enact Heidegger, Heidegger's Aletheia, right? Is this reciprocal opening, right? And so, and, 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 and the work by Aaron and others shows, that's how you fall in love with something. Like if you disclose something and then I disclose and we do that reciprocal opening where I open up what I can be for you and that leads you to open up what you can be for me and then we reciprocally open, we fall in love with each other. And so, right, and, and that, that, I think that anagogic process, right, that reciprocal opening, uh, you can see it in flow states and, right, that's, that, that, that's one way of trying to get this notion of noticing and dialogue, the dialogical relationship into, you know, we, we can connect it with practices that we're engaged in. That's really interesting, you know, because John is increasingly interested in practices like circling or even parkour where we, and of course he himself is an experienced meditator and, you know, Tai Chi practitioner. What are those practices that we can actually start engaging in that create that opening as opposed to the narrowing? Because it almost feels like, from these conversations, that the narrowing is, is almost our default, that we have to actively work to unlock. You know, we have a, a left-brain culture. We have one that high, you know, really focuses on propositional knowing. So to access those different areas, we need to start doing something with it. And so another person, I spoke to a few people around this, people who are actually doing something in this space. Um, one of the most interesting was uh, Greg Thomas. So Greg runs with his wife, Jewel, something called the Jazz Leadership Project. Jazz is really fascinating to me because jazz has been used by a few people on the channel, um, including Daniel Schmachtenberger, Jordan Hall, and Jamie Wheel in the uh, Making Sense of Sense Making film we put out as this metaphor for collective intelligence, right? So if the idea is we can't make sense of the world anymore uh, well, using the tools we used to use, we have to come together in some way and, and make sense together, 
how does it actually look? Like, what's the best way for us to come into some kind of coherence where we're really listening to each other and something new is emerging between us as we talk? And the metaphor they use in that was uh, jazz, you know? And I, it's not the only people who've used that metaphor. And then I got really interested in, wow, like jazz is a really excellent metaphor for that. And Greg Thomas has not only run the Jazz Leadership Project, where they're actually taking people into transformation, you know, leadership workshops, you know, even corporate change workshops, using jazz as a model, but he's also an integral theorist and really interested in um, collective intelligence, really like uh, knows a lot about the theory of it. So we had a really interesting conversation with him around how this metaphor of jazz can be used to understand, uh, you know, different ways of knowing. We have a, a concept called ensemble mindset that uses the idea of collective intelligence. Our brief elevator uh, description of ensemble mindset would be um, collaborative co-creation through collective intelligence. So it encompasses collaboration, working together, co-creation. When you say co-creation, then that means that there's more than one and there is also an, an idea that there's multiple going on, but we're doing it together. And the collective intelligence, I think, is very closely tied to what creativity researcher and jazz pianist Keith Sawyer called group genius, which takes the concept of flow, which his dissertation advisor, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, of course, famously wrote about, and extends it to groups working together. And we see that and hear it and feel it in jazz all the time. So what we've been doing through the Jazz Leadership Project is applying it to personal and organizational development through workshops with a live jazz band. If you're coming from two completely different or disparate perspectives, you, you got to have some type of common ground from which to then have that conversation. So in jazz, that common ground is usually knowledge of the blues. There has to be a common ground of shared value, shared meaning, so that your conversation and your interaction can then really engage in that emergent quality of something new and potentially better coming out of it. And if you don't have it, then there's gotta be some grounding for the conversation in the first place. And of course, we see this in politics where <laughs> the, the different camps that are available because of the camps they're in, oftentimes these days, they don't even have the willingness to engage in conversation. And I mean conversation not where they're just arguing back and forth. I mean where they're truly listening. So that goes back to listening. In Jazz Leadership Project, we have three levels of listening that I'd like to share with you. The first is just being attentive, you know, really focusing on what the other person is saying. Then there's empathetic listening where you include an open heart um, and you can feel or you, you listen deeply to feel where the other person is coming from. And then there's generative listening, which we get from Otto Schalmer's theory U concept, where generative listening is open heart and open will. So you're listening to one another, and then you are feeling one another, kind of like whole body, not just cognitive, heart, gut, the whole thing. And then you're working together to co-create a future. Future possibilities are there. So Greg has this really cool model of, of how we come together and, and work together and create something new. And another person who's doing that is Benita Roy, who we've had on the channel a few times, is also a systems theorist and a facilitator who runs what she calls collective insight practice. There's a lot of parallels with, with what happens in, say, a jazz ensemble, etc. It's coming together. Uh, it's a little bit different. That's coming together to specifically, rather than play music, come to a collective insight. And Benita had a really interesting kind of watch out for this space, you know, and it's, it's a cognitive trap I found myself coming into, which is if we go okay, there's too much propositional, rigid model making going on, and there's too many people who are using engineering language to try and explain something that's very complex. The swing that can happen is, well, that means the embodied, really flowing, intuitive people are, are better in some way. 
And of, of course, that's not the case. It's, it's always both are needed. So when you're doing collective insight practice, you will, can actually feel that energetically people are processing something, but one comes out abstract. That's the social processing temperament. And one comes out as narrative. Why are you always like this? Blah, 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 blah. And there's a tendency to think that one is more embodied than the other. They're both triggered. They're both out of, regu- they're not, their affects are not regulated. Not, it, but we tend to think the narrative mythic is somehow closer to anchored and body. It's just a dis- different social processing um, uh, energy. You have to process that energy in social space. It's going to come out whether narrative or abstract. And Benita points out that when, when people come together to do collective insight practice, that is the main fault line that comes up. There's people who explain the world through stories, and there's people who explain the world through mental models. And very often they sort of clash, but it's very important that we find a way to, whatever side we're on, understand that that's just another way that that person has of, of seeing the world and explaining their experience. And I think there's another parallel that I pick up a lot in sort of more alternative circles. There's a real aversion to the former, like propositional ways of knowing. And that I think is like that is really, really important, like stories. So we learnt, we, we both trained as counsellors, and the idea in counselling is that you are, you're talking your way to more insight, you're talking your way to understanding yourself better. But that can be, like so many of those kind of therapeutic models, I think both of us would agree, don't actually work that well if they're not including the wisdom of the body, if they're not including like, what are you feeling in this moment? What, and some kind of potentially emotional clearing work as well of like maybe sometimes you just need to go out and shout and scream and get into the like let that out it's not just about talking your way to a solution but on the other side you can also find in the more alternative world an overemphasis on the body and a complete denial of the need for kind of processing story and I think that the that for me is really interesting that and my sense is, having, having kind of gone into this work and trained in this work, is that both are needed. That we need to do the sort of clearing, the, the embodied work, and kind of be really alive to what's coming up in our bodies. But also, we do need to articulate it. It's not one or the other. And so many times, like I've been in a breath workshop, or I've been in some kind of transformational workshop, and they're like, okay, let go of the story, let go of the story. And there's no space given to, to talk about what might have come up. And my sense is that if we don't do that, then we don't articulate, we don't make real in our systems the insights that we might have experienced in a more liminal, transformational space. That actually by articulating it, like if you have a transformative experience or you have some kind of insight, you actually need to talk about it. You need to make it concrete. By talking about it, you make something that's kind of half understood or half perceived real. Like there is some deep, um, in the beginning was the word, like there's a reason why that is at the center of so much of our kind of mythology is because by articulating, by conceptualizing, we do make, make things more real. And those two ways of knowing have to be yeah, integrated in more of these conversations. Yeah, it's really interesting. As you're talking about that, I, I, uh, kind of getting an insight that I hadn't thought of before. So John Dravecki, uh, when we spoke, he, he referenced at one point that narrative links the different ways of knowing together. So it links your propositional knowing with the other types of knowing. It's kind of like a, a through line that connects it all together. And w- what it feels like is that it's, a, it's also important to acknowledge that the different ways of knowing are not always appropriate for every situation. Like you can't really walk around without any narrative all the time. Like you might have, you know, like in a meditation space, you, you need some kind of narrative to link your life together. But there are times where Verbeke points out that narrative itself can become constraining, you know, and that's like you said, the narrative, the story we tell about ourselves can start trapping us and start blinding us to certain things. So while it's important, it's almost it feels like it needs to be regenerated through these other ways of knowing. So by going into a flow state, for example, the Verbeke points out that uh, that kind of propositional knowing and that narrative ego uh, goes into the background. And these other ways of knowing come into the foreground. It's like you're deeply present with whatever's going on. Everything matters a lot. You're really there. And that's really important because it feels like it kind of regenerates and it gives us a little bit of space away from the story. And then when we go back to it, back to our ideas, back to our things we think we know, we can kind of regenerate them from that space. So 
So it feels important to, to, to kind of um, add that in, that it's not that we are looking to live permanently in some different way of knowing. It's that there's kind of a dance that has to take place between all of these different types, and we have to use them in the right way at the right time. I think it's also important to talk about that John Vivekey in particular, his next focus is going to be on kind of intersubjective ways of knowing, like this more participatory way of knowing. I know he's got a series coming up about Socrates, called After Socrates, about the history of dialectic and how we come to truth together, how we come to understanding together. So I know that this has sort of become a real focus of his journey. So it feels like a lot of people are kind of aligning in this space. And just because I know that there's more articles coming up, do you want to talk about who you're going to be, who we're going to be hearing from in the other articles that you're going to be bringing out? Yeah, so the series is in three parts, and as well as, as the people we've mentioned, uh, we also have coming up Jamie Wheel and that kind of very interesting perspective around utopia, dystopian thinking, and how that's feeding into this whole space. Then we also have Dr. Rosalind Watts, who is a psychedelic researcher. So it's looking at when we really go into a very different space, a very different state, what kind of information do we then get access to? And, and why is that relevant to the therapy? Why is it relevant to, to culture as well? We have a few um, facilitators and practitioners as well who will be new names to a lot of people, but they're really doing a lot of interesting work. And we'll also be drawing on um, Peter Lindbergh's ideas as well to kind of to keep a, a kind of map of the mimetic tribes that are at play uh, right now in our world and, and what, what, what missing, what ways of knowing are they currently missing and what might help the conversation, what might help mediate between them, let's say. So we'll put a link to the first article in the series in the show notes and follow us on Medium if you'd like to see the other two in the series. And uh, beyond that, we're also going to be putting more energy and focus into our written output. So we'll be having more articles coming up on Medium in the future. Well done for making it to the end. Just wanted to let you know a few things we've got coming up, including the biggest event we've ever done, the Rebel Wisdom Festival, which will be a mix of ideas and dialogues between people like Daniel Schmachtenberger, Rupert Sheldrake, John Vivekey, and many more. And because wisdom isn't just intellectual, it's also about practice, we'll be offering experiences like circling, different interpersonal dialogue, mindfulness, breathwork, and many other with world-class facilitators. We're also running our first online course called Sensemaking 101. And if you're enjoying the content, you can help us make more by joining the Rebel Wisdom Club, which will give you discounts on the courses and the events, and also access to a load more content on the website, including all of our live events. It'll also give you access to our growing community, which is something we want to make a real focus for 2020, adding more meetups and other services for members. So hope you enjoyed the film and see you soon.